Couple of minutes, so uh, grab your bagels and take your I yeah, yeah, that was what we were talking about. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, good morning everyone. Welcome to uh, Peter's um, public thesis um, talk. Exploring exotic transients, stellar explosions, tidal disruptions, and contact object mergers in the golden age of time and astronomy. Um, so this talk is the culmination of several years of um, uh, Peter exploring the landscape of time domain exotica and their host galaxies. And I know that at times it may have felt like a random walk in that landscape, but um, such is life on the cutting edge. Um, as Peter will show you today, the field has evolved quite dramatically during the course of his thesis, um, driven both by an order of magnitude increase in the discovery rate of optical transients, but also by the dawn of multi-messenger gravitational wave electromagnetic um, astronomy. And in fact, just yesterday, LIGO detected the second binary neutron star merger ever seen. Um, which has been quite exciting. We're in the midst of chasing the counterparts, so if you see people rushing out of the room, don't be alarmed. Um, but with this increase in discovery rate comes the challenge of how to identify the rare needles in the haystack. And I think part of what P Peter will show you today is how we manage to increase the efficiency of discovering rare types of events like superwomen and supernovae from a few percent up to about 20%, which enables quite a step forward in studying these sources. Now, identifying the sources of interest is only step one. Uh, to make progress on the physics and the progenitors and the environments requires a lot of painstaking, um, hard observational work using a lot of facilities. And Peter has been the PI of uh, many telescope proposals like MMT, at Magellan, at Gemini, at Hubble, Chandra, Swift. Um, so he's got his hands dirty with a lot of data. Um, the added challenge has been that some of these events that Peter has been picking up and studying um, have lasted about half of his thesis. And in fact, I think some of these events are going to accompany him to his next position as they very slowly fade away. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how, how this evolves. Um, at the same time that Peter has been studying these transients, he also developed a lot of expertise in studying the galaxy environments. Um, and in fact, his first project involved taking about 300 orbits of Hubble data, uh, taking four different instruments, analyzing all of these observations, then correlating all of this with ground-based observations of afterglows from something like 13 different observatories, 
to create kind of the ultimate mapping of where gamma ray bursts happen inside their galaxies. So I think this project kind of showed uh, both familiarity and understanding of using galaxies, but also how much Peter wants to work with data and, uh, and enjoy that part. Uh, in the next few years, the field will undergo another uh, big leap as LSST comes online in about three years from now, and gravitational wave detectors increase in number and in sensitivity. And I think that with the, Peter's experience, he's really poised to be a leader in this upcoming revolution. So next year, Peter will be a Sierra uh, postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern University, where he's going to join some of my former group members, uh, Wen Fei Fong and Rafael Marguti and Kate Alexander as they plot how to take over the world of time of astronomy. Uh, but until then, let's first hear from Peter about what he did in his thesis. Take care. Okay, thank you, Ido, for that introduction. So astronomy has been a big part of my life uh, for a very long time. Um, ever since I was first mesmerized by the, the night sky in fifth or sixth grade, I've always tried to get my hands on a telescope. Uh, this is my dad and I installing an 8-inch telescope in an observatory that we built in Colorado. A few years later, upgraded to a 14-inch telescope to do some more detailed astrophotography. But lately, I've been using 256-inch telescopes like the MMT and Magellan <laughs> telescopes, uh, upgrading to do science. So of course, a lot of people have helped me along the way to get to where I am today. And so first, I want to thank my advisor, Ido, for all of his guidance and wisdom on how to be an effective scientist and for encouraging me to write lots of telescope proposals and explore a wide range of topics in time domain astronomy. I also want to thank all the current and former uh, members of our research team. It's been just a, such a great group of people uh, to work and hang out with. I also want to thank all the various collaborators that I've uh, uh, worked with through the years, the Harvard Astro grad students for being such a great community, all the administrators who make the behind-the-scenes operations of grad school function smoothly, and uh, my thesis committee. And I also want to thank uh, former advisors and teachers that I've had, and uh, uh, especially Tom Smith. Um, he was my middle and high school astronomy teacher and is pretty much the reason why I got into astronomy. Um, here he is scoping out the uh, location where we put the observatory in Colorado. I also want to thank all the various friends that I've met through the years, including some of uh, the friends I've met here at, at Harvard over the last six years, uh, and also friends from various other parts of my life. I've cherished all the, the fun times that we've had. I also want to thank my family, especially my dad and my mom, uh, for their unwavering support and encouragement of all of my interests. Um, as we saw, my dad helped me build an observatory, so I think he went above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, to support my interest in astronomy. And then, of course, my life would be nowhere near the same without my wife, Katie. Um, her kind and caring nature continuously inspires me to be my best self. Uh, and I'm so grateful for all the fun adventures that we've had uh, while we've been living here in New England. And then, you know, I'm so excited for this next adventure that we're going to get to share together uh, with the new addition uh, to our family coming very soon. <laughs> and then finally, um, I want to dedicate this talk to my mom, uh, Susan Blanchard. Um, there, there's just no way I could stand up here without thanking her for everything that she's done for me. Um, and I'm just, uh, there's just no way I would be here today without her. And I know that she's smiling down today. So now, moving into the science portion of this talk. So when we look up at the night sky, we often think of the universe as a static background of stars and galaxies. But it turns out that the universe is a surprisingly dynamic place, filled with short-lived transient phenomena, like the example of this light that we captured from the collision of two neutron stars. Now, these transient phenomena, by their nature, are unpredictable. So how do we know where, where to point our telescopes to capture the light from these events? So the first dedicated transient searches were galaxy-targeted. This means that they were taking repeated observations of relatively nearby uh, massive galaxies, searching for exploding stars or supernovae. But we now find ourselves comfortably in the era of wide-field surveys. These surveys cover very large fractions of the sky every night and are therefore unbiased with respect to host galaxy environment, allowing you to find transients like this one here, which occurred in an unknown 
a galaxy that you would not have otherwise targeted. Uh, and of course, also, you know, these wide field surveys have overall boosted the, the transient discovery rate considerably. So changing the survey strategy in this way has directly led to the discovery of new phenomena, most notably this, these superluminous supernovae. These very bright explosions are intrinsically rare, and they occur in, a, occur in an unusual environment. So it took these wide field surveys to discover them. And a major part of supernova studies today is trying to understand how these very bright events fit into the, the larger picture of massive stellar death. And these wide field surveys have also led to increased studies of transients which occur at the centers of their galaxies, like tidal disruption events, which is the disruption of a star by the tidal forces of a supermassive black hole. Um, after uh, the star is disrupted, some of this uh, stellar debris will be bound to the system, uh, will eventually fall back towards the, the black hole, perhaps leading to an accretion disk and a bright flare. These events are also very rare, with a rate of about 1 per 10,000 to 100,000 years per galaxy. And recently, uh, improved surveys have come online, like the Zwicky Transient Facility, or will in the very near future, like LSST. So the rate of discovery is continuing to increase. You know, so we're faced with this challenge of, of how do we match this increase in discovery rate with an increase in our understanding of these rare uh, transients. And in parallel with uh, progress in, in these wide field optical surveys, we've seen recent great advances in multi-messenger multi -messenger astronomy, which is defined by the joint detection of gravitational waves and electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation from astrophysical ob objects, like the collisions of two uh, compact objects. So this provides a new window to study these compact objects, how they produce some of the heaviest elements in the universe, and also, uh, they'll, they'll be useful as a, as a new probe of cosmology. So as part of my thesis, I investigated all of these various exotic transients and have generally taken this two-pronged approach to time domain astronomy. So on the one hand, I focused on studying the transients themselves. So a part of this is uh, uh, figuring out how to efficiently identify these transients from surveys and then perform detailed follow-up to then characterize and understand the physics of superluminous supernovae and tidal disruption events. And then the second part has focused on uh, studying where these transients happen and what do their environmental preferences tell us about the sources that ultimately produce um, these transients. So launching into the first part, identification and follow-up. So the goal here is to um, efficiently identify these transients from surveys, then perform this detailed multi-wavelength follow-up to, for example, uh, produce these you know, well-sampled optical light curves and spectra uh, that we can then use to understand the physics of these transients. So that you can kind of think of this as an alternative, uh, alternative approach to, for example, a more of an after-the-fact study of more poorly sampled uh, events. You know, and, and this kind of approach is really important because for superluminous supernovae and TDEs, we're still in this small sample regime where we're still finding individual events that provide new uh, that exhibit new behavior that we've never seen before that can provide new insight about the, the general population. So if we want to find superluminous supernovae, first we need to understand a little bit about their properties. So when, when these events were first discovered, uh, they exhibited unusual spectra that had never been seen before, very blue spectra with unusual absorption lines. And so they didn't naturally fit into this previous uh, kind of standard spectroscopic classification scheme that had been in use for decades to, uh, to um, understand the spectra of, of supernovae. But when the, the redshifts of, of these new events were um, uh, se uh, secured, it was quickly realized that these are very luminous uh, uh, explosions that reach peak luminosities of greater than minus 21 absolute magnitude, which equates to being about 10 to 100 times brighter uh, than normal supernovae. And so, of course, they radiate a, a <coughs> more total energy. And it turns out that these very bright supernovae occur in faint galaxies, unlike more normal core collapse supernovae, which tend to occur in these uh, more massive spiral uh, galaxies. And in some cases, we need the depth and resolving power of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, to, to be able to study the host galaxies of these events. 
And so when we look at a sample of superluminous supernova host galaxies, uh, shown as the stars uh, in this plot here, and we compare their brightnesses with kind of the characteristic luminosity of a superluminous supernova, we find that the, the supernovae themselves are about two to four magnitudes brighter than their host galaxies. So this high contrast between the supernova brightness itself and its underlying host galaxy is an observational feature that we can use to extract these events from surveys. And then if we're talking about tidal disruption events, which occur uh, where the supermassive black hole is located at the center of their galaxies, then if we're looking for transients with very small offsets uh, from the centers of their hosts. Now, when I first started this project, I focused on one survey, the PanSTARS uh, survey for transients. There were kind of few surveys at that time re publicly reporting detections. But since then, in collaboration with uh, fellow grad student Sebastian Gomez, we've expanded this search to include uh, all publicly reported transients from all of the ongoing uh, surveys. So we have this pipeline that takes in the data streams from all of, these, uh, all of the ongoing surveys. And so for each transient detection, uh, we query galaxy catalogs to identify an underlying host galaxy or, or lack thereof. Um, and then apply these selection criteria that I've alluded to, looking for events with high contrast between the transient and host galaxy to target superluminous supernovae, and transients with small offsets to target TDEs. So once we've selected transients uh, using these criteria, uh, for relatively bright uh, targets, we might immediately get a spectrum with the 60-inch telescope at Whipple. Or for fainter targets, we'll try and build up a, a light curve um, with a 48-inch telescope <clears throat> and look for transients that are rising with time, uh, getting brighter, um, and, uh, or have blue colors um, uh, because these superluminous supernovae and TDEs tend to be bluer than normal uh, supernovae at peak. And then we also have, uh, of course, MMT and Magellan uh, as part of the spectroscopic uh, resources for classification. So carrying out this strategy, we find that about 20% of our classified transients are either superluminous supernovae or TDEs. We can see the largest kind of portion is the, uh, the superluminous supernovae. And this is a, 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 a higher success rate uh, compared to what's been achieved in previous surveys, um, uh, achieving rates closer to, to 4% um, or even less. Um, you know, uh, compared to the, these, these previous surveys, which took more of an agnostic approach um, to classification and are, were not necessarily focused in on trying to boost the rates of superluminous supernovae. So when, you know, what we've shown here is, you know, since our science goal is, is to, to do this detailed follow-up of, of these rare transients, we've shown that we can actually boost these rates uh, 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 in, by, uh, in classification by uh, using these motivated target selection methods. And I just want to point out that even the normal um, supernovae that we find, uh, like these type 1As and type 2 supernovae, are generally in fairly faint galaxies because of this magnitude contrast that we're using. So even these normal supernovae, we can still study uh, uh, the effects of sort of um, uh, low metallicity, uh, faint galaxy environments on, on normal supernovae. And that's led to a paper uh, by a member of our team. So this efficient identification at early times allows us to do uh, the, this uh, detailed multi-wavelength follow-up to very late times to, to study the, in detail these transients. And so for some events, we might uh, trigger various resources to get UV, X-ray, uh, and radio data. <coughs> but the, the real workhorses of this observational program uh, to get long-term optical monitoring is, is the 6.5 meter MMT in Magellan telescopes. These large aperture telescopes allow us to track these events for hundreds of days. Um, but if we want to kind of push uh, uh, our monitoring to even later times, you might use larger telescopes or also the Hubble Space Telescope. So just to give you a sense of kind of the scale of this program and what kind of resources are required to go into this, you know, it's taken a substantial amount of investment of MMT and Magellan to do this, uh, both classification but also this detailed uh, follow-up of these uh, uh, transients, and a substantial amount of time on the smaller telescopes as well. And it's also led to uh, you know, 
HST proposals, Gemini proposals, and Chandra proposals. And I just want to point out, these are only proposals that I've uh, been the PI of, so there's, you know, quite a few other proposals from other members of our team. Uh, so, it, you know, it's a, been a substantial effort uh, to, do, to carry out this program. So now transitioning into the, the science questions that we want to address with these classified uh, uh, superluminous supernovae, you know, I'm going to be focusing on the hydrogen-poor superluminous supernovae. So these are events which have lost their, their uh, hydrogen envelopes prior to explosion, and so we don't see hydrogen in their spectra. And again, these are very luminous explosions, 10 to 100 times brighter than normal supernovae. So we want to understand what are their power sources that allow them to reach these uh, luminosities, and also what accounts for their observed diversity. These events uh, exhibit a large range of evolution timescales and luminosities. We can see that some events uh, rise and fade relatively quickly. Other events are almost uh, look much more flat, uh, slower evolving near peak. Alternatively, we can kind of look at this diversity if we take a look at this plot of the uh, characteristic rise time scale versus the characteristic decline time scale, <coughs> where we find that some events um, rise on time scales less than 20 days, whereas others take closer to 100 days to rise to peak. So these, this kind of large range uh, of evolution time scales has kind of led to this question of whether or not there are multiple subpopulations within superluminous supernovae, and if they require different power sources or even explosion uh, mechanisms. So to power a normal hydrogen-poor supernova, you know, essentially uh, the, the, you know, the power source is coming from the radioactive decay of freshly synthesized uh, uh, radioactive nickel, uh, where you have these, these radioactive decay chains as this nickel de decays to cobalt and then cobalt into iron. These decays release energy that essentially heats the expanding ejecta. So we can go ahead and fit this, this model to normal supernovae, um, and you find that you need about 0.05 to 0.5 solar masses of radioactive nickel to explain these, these normal supernovae. So a natural question is whether or not uh, we can explain superluminous supernovae, their much larger luminosities, by you know, essentially requiring more radioactive material. Maybe they're more massive stars that are producing uh, more, uh, maybe closer to three or five solar masses uh, of nickel. You know, it turns out if we go ahead and try to, to fit this model, this radioactive decay model, to the fast evolving superluminous supernovae, we find it's inconsistent. Uh, these events are inconsistent with radioactive decay. You essentially find discrepancies between the, the nickel masses implied by the peak and late time uh, light curve behavior. But uh, you know, an important question that we're, we're still trying to understand is how much uh, radioactive material is synthesized in these superluminous supernovae. So we know that this model can't explain their luminosities, but we still want to understand how much uh, radioactive material they produce, because this is important for understanding their connection to normal supernovae, and for understanding how much of this sort of extra energy um, we need to account for with a different uh, power source. So I've been able to address this question by getting very late time observations of superluminous supernovae uh, in my uh, sample from uh, uh, Magellan and MMT. So with these late time observations, we can um, place a limit on the, the synthesized amount of, of radioactive material. So on the left here, the supernova of interest uh, classified as part of our program is this magenta light curve here, for which I obtain these deep late time upper limits at about 200 to 300 days after explosion. So at these time scales, the relevant uh, decay chain is this decay of cobalt into iron. Um, uh, if, so if, if, if luminosity is, is being contributed by radio, radioactive decay at these time scales, then essentially we can just uh, kind of scale this, this radioactive decay curve down to, to match these limits to infer an upper limit on the, on the amount of radioactive material. So carrying out this exercise for both this supernova as well as a, another one from my sample uh, where I also obtained these late time limits, I found that the implied limits on the amount of radioactive material indicates that uh, uh, the amount of uh, nickel that they produce kind of falls within the range uh, uh, found for normal supernovae. 
So this is, this is telling us that at least some of these superluminous supernovae do not produce substantially more nickel than normal uh, radioactive decay-powered supernovae. So clearly some other power source is required to explain all of this extra energy that we're seeing from these events. But it's a bit of a different story for the slowly evolving superluminous supernovae. These events, which can have timescales uh, close to around 100 uh, uh, days, uh, many of these events have been shown to exhibit decline uh, uh, rates consistent with what you expect from radioactive decay. And in fact, some events have been, uh, have been claimed to be consistent with um, parent stability, this theoretical parent stability supernova model, uh, which predicts these very long uh, uh, timescales because this is the explosion of a very massive uh, star greater than uh, 100 solar masses or so. Uh, in this theoretical uh, uh, explosion model, which could generate enough nickel um, to power these slowly evolving superluminous supernovae. But it's been shown that some of these slowly evolving events actually have rise times that are too fast to be explained uh, by these parent stability models. So there's been this lingering question about whether or not this parent stability model is a, you know, a viable explanation for some of these slowly evolving events. So I've shown uh, through a case study of, of uh, an event in my sample, PS16FGT, that late time data is key for being able to distinguish and, uh, and really assess um, parent stability models for events where you have either very slow rises or an event uh, where you don't really have sufficient data near peak to, to make a strong statement. So in particular, this event uh, kind of exhibits this, this uh, transition in its decline um, uh, to a much slower decline uh, than the kind of the uh, decline rate near peak. So, in, uh, in particular, this decline rate uh, changes to be much slower uh, than what you expect for parent stability. So, this is only the second event that actually uh, has been shown to, to exhibit a decline slower than what you expect for radio radioactive decay. Um, so, this is telling us that, that you know, looking at this this full evolution of this light curve, uh, really anchored by this late time data, that the, the parent stability model uh, is, is inconsistent with this uh, supernova. And I just want to highlight that you know, it's taken this kind of detailed late time follow up enabled by being able to identify these objects efficiently near peak to, to be able to, to carry out this kind of experiment. Um, and also, just to, just to kind of point out the scale, um, as Ida was mentioning, some of these events have lasted, you know, uh, most of my uh, significant fraction of my PhD thesis, you know, this event in the observer frame has taken about two and a half years to collect all of the data, and we're still collecting data on this event. We have a planned HST observation for this summer to continue tracking its evolution, uh, which will further constrain the models. So we've looked at both fast and slow superluminous supernovae, and we've seen that this radioactive decay model is really unable to explain this full diversity. So there's clearly some other source of energy that's required to power the light curves. So one proposed model is the circumstellar interaction model. So you can think of this as kind of an external model where the rapidly expanding ejecta slams into surrounding material, which, can, which then converts kinetic energy into radiation. But this, this model is generally disfavored <clears throat> because we don't typically see interaction uh, signatures in the spectra, and also X-ray and radio observations indicate fairly low circumstellar densities. So this other uh, model that's been proposed is the central engine model, and you can think of this as more of an internal model, where you have some central energy source that essentially heats um, the ejecta from within. And we think, you know, kind of a, the most popular version of this is the uh, 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 sort of extracting energy from the spin down of a rapidly rotating magnetar formed uh, after the collapse of the core. And so if we go ahead and, and fit this magnetar model to the light curves of superluminous supernovae, we find that this magnetar model can account for the, the full range of evolution timescales. And in particular, I want to highlight this, this late time um, behaviors that we saw in this, this event just a few slides ago from PS16FGT. 
Uh, if we fit a magnetar model to the light curve of this event, we find that the magnetar model can account for this uh, late time flattening. <laughs> and it provides a, a robust prediction for future, uh, for its future luminosity that we're going to be able to directly test uh, with more HST observations. So, you know, looking at these light curves, uh, it does not appear that the, the light curves require multiple power sources. There's also other evidence that's pointing us towards the central engine model, and in particular this link between superluminous supernovae and gamma ray bursts, uh, which are these uh, relativistic um, explosions that are, are known to be linked to, to massive stars. And uh, uh, sort of this first piece of evidence is that the, these superluminous supernovae and GRBs occur in similar host galaxies. So if we look at a sample of superluminous supernova hosts, these black stars, uh, compared to a sample of long GRB uh, host galaxies, um, we find that they both require relatively low metallicity and low stellar mass uh, galaxies. There's also spectroscopic similarities between superluminous supernovae and the supernovae that are associated with GRBs. If we compare the uh, late time nebular phase spectra of superluminous supernovae, so this, this phase where essentially the uh, ejecta is becoming optically thin and you can kind of peer into the inner uh, uh, ejecta, uh, at this phase we find um, a close match with uh, a super, a GRB associated uh, supernovae compared to normal supernovae. So this, this uh, link between the, the nebular phase spectra of G, uh, GRB supernovae and superluminous supernovae is indicating that they probably have an, a similar inner structure and composition. And also, in a, a particular event in my sample, SN 2017 DWH, has provided a completely new link uh, between superluminous supernovae and GRB supernovae. So this event evolved spectroscopically from a spectrum that looked similar to other superluminous supernovae, uh, with the exception of a very strong absorption line in the blue, to a spectrum about a month later uh, uh, that was much redder and matched the spectra of GRB supernovae. And in particular, is much redder than other superluminous supernovae at a similar phase. So this was a very rapid evolution to a much redder spectrum that we had not seen before in any other superluminous supernova. And by modeling this uh, spectrum near peak, I found that this um, absorption line, uh, the strong absorption line in the blue is uh, uh, resulting from cobalt-2 absorption. So this association um, of this absorption with cobalt-2 combined with this rapid transition uh, to a much redder spectrum uh, is indicating that this event essentially has enhanced absorption from iron group elements, similar to GRB supernovae. So this event is showing us that some superluminous supernovae are not only similar to GRB supernovae in the nebular phase, but also in the, this, the early photospheric phase, indicating a similar composition in the outer layers. But an important question is, why are events like 17 DWH so rare? in the sample of superluminous supernovae? Are we seeing perhaps sort of an unusually large uh, uh, amount of nickel in this supernova? Or maybe we're seeing more nickel at earlier times due to the influence of kind of a jet-like outflow from the central engine, which could enhance nickel production kind of in the outer layers by kind of en enhancing the mixing of, of nickel uh, due to this jet. And if we look at simulations of GRB supernovae, uh, we, uh, it's been shown that um, uh, you can get enhanced nickel production kind of along uh, the jet, uh, the engine-driven uh, jet outflow. And this uh, manifests itself when you look at the synthetic spectra from one of these simulations as stronger absorption in the blue uh, uh, when you look at these polar observing angles. There's this angular, this viewing angle dependence uh, on absorption in the blue due to this angular dependence in the nickel uh, distribution. So this event motivated me to look at a sample uh, of, of spectra of superluminous supernovae where I found a correlation between the spectral shape 
and uh, the absorption strength uh, due to this cobalt-2 absorption. So these very red superluminous supernovae, where this event 17DWH is the most extreme example, tend to have the strongest absorption from cobalt-2, uh, unlike the, the much bluer superluminous supernovae, which have weaker absorption. So this is you know, an observa you know, likely an observational manifestation of, of either a very strongly varying uh, abundance of iron group elements in these events, or maybe we're actually seeing uh, an observational effect of these viewing angle effects coupled with the influence of the central engine on kind of the aspherical nature of the explosion. So I'm going to switch gears to uh, some of the work that I've done focused on tidal disruption events. So like superluminous supernovae, TDEs are also a very diverse class of transients. Um, you know, at, at this point, there are several dozen good uh, TDE candidates that have been discovered in, uh, you know, normal or you know, normal in this context, kind of uh, quiescent or inactive galaxies, because uh, essentially, you know, you need to to make sure that you're actually seeing a new phenomenon rather than uh, potentially AGN variability. So that's been a key part of of how we've identified these early transients. Um, but you know, and we found you know, this wide diversity where some are. are dominated by X-ray flares, consistent with what you expect from this, the accretion of the stellar debris. Others are dominated by a UV optical flare that's presented uh, a lot of mysteries about its origin. So while there's, there's still many, many questions about TDEs, uh, which occur in quiescent galaxies, I think it's interesting to think about um, what happens when you have a TDE in, a, in an active galaxy. So a galaxy that has pre-existing accretion and a whole host of various uh, dust and gas structures near the black hole. In fact, the rate of TDEs in active galaxies might actually be enhanced due to the presence of nuclear star forming clouds, which could essentially you know, provide a fresh batch of stars near the supermassive black hole. So I think it's key for understanding how tidal disruption events fit into this general picture of AGN variability. <coughs> But of course, TDEs and AGN pr present a, a quite a formidable observational challenge. You know, it, it's you know we have to think about how do we distinguish kind of normal AGN variability or maybe you know un unknown extreme forms of AGN variability from a true disruption of a star, or perhaps a supernova which occurred very close to the nucleus. But again, I think it's important that we study these nuclear transients if we want to have a complete picture of supermassive black hole activity. So this leads to my study of PS16DTM, which was a luminous UV optical flare at the nucleus of an active galaxy, a narrow-line Seifert one galaxy. Uh, and we, de you know, determined it this, this, the AGN nature of this galaxy from uh, mission line ratios, as well as a pre-existing um, uh, uh, SDSS spectrum, as well as other archival um, data. And so we knew, kind of. Uh, uh, once this transient occurred, that this transient occurred in a galaxy with a black hole of around 10 to the 6 solar masses. Um, and we also uh, had a, a pre-existing archival X-ray detection from the AGN, consistent with what you expect for uh, narrow-line Seifert galaxies. So looking at the, the transient itself, so this, this transient uh, rose in about 50 days, uh, to essentially a, a plateau phase that lasted for about 100 days, during which it exhibited no color evolution. And once we added up kind of all the light coming in from the UV and optical bands to calculate the bolometric luminosity, we found that during this plateau phase, it radiated at near the Eddington luminosity of the 10 to the 6 solar mass black hole. You know, the, this uh, giving you know, a strong link uh, kind of a strong initial piece of evidence linking this transient to activity near the supermassive black hole. And if we look at its X-ray evolution, we found that this pre-existing X-ray detection dropped by at least an order of magnitude during this transient. So we have this very bright uh, UV optical flare coupled with this significant dimming in the X-rays. And if we look at its spectral evolution, Compared to the pre-flare 
uh, archival spectrum, this event became much bluer um, and, and exhibited uh, the, the broad lines essentially became stronger uh, uh, during the flare. So essentially the, it almost appeared, you know, it appeared like the transient uh, was essentially the AGN component getting brighter uh, in the spectrum uh, based on this very close match between the, the transient spectra and the spectra of other narrow line Cfer one galaxies. So this was additional evidence linking this event to the supermassive black hole rather than some unrelated supernova um, near the nucleus. So putting together all of this evidence, <clears throat> uh, we have this 100-day plateau near the Eddington luminosity, the kind of first piece of evidence uh, linking this event to the supermassive black hole. Then looking at its temperature evolution and the UV to near-infrared spectra that we obtained, uh, we found that these spectra did not match supernovae and instead made much more sense in a picture in which uh, you have essentially a, a, this AGN component of the spectrum, these broad lines getting stronger. Uh, the second piece of evidence linking this event to, su to the supermassive black hole. And then the, the amplitude of this flare and its rapid evolution are unusual for normal forms of AGN variability. And an important point, this, this, this UV optical flare coupled with the significant dimming of the x-rays is also unusual for AGN variability. So all of these pieces of evidence ruling out supernovae and AGN variability lead, led us to, to consider a tidal disruption event um, interpretation for this transient. So thinking about this event as a TDE, here I'm showing an illustration of, of how this scenario uh, might work. So before the disruption of the star, we have the pre-existing accretion disk um, and its pre-existing X-ray emitting region near the center. Then after the disruption of the star, we have a new accretion disk formed by the stellar debris, which is able to obscure the X-ray emitting region, uh, uh, the pre-existing X-ray emitting region from the AGN, explaining this drop in the X-rays. And then at the same time, this a uh, new accretion disk formed by the stellar debris can provide, you know, provides the flare that we see in the optical and UV, uh, which gets essentially reprocessed by the broad, the pre-existing broadline region of the AGN, leading to this spectrum that we see, where we see these increased broad emission lines. So this scenario is really the only, um, the only way we can kind of simultaneously account for the significant UV optical flare and this uh, uh, dimming in the x-rays. So this event motivated me to look at TDE, sort of the broader context of TDEs, and in particular compare the, the luminosities of TDEs which occurred in AGN, these stars here, um, to TDEs which occurred in quiescent galaxies, where I found that these three events with, uh, which occurred in AGN radiate near the Eddington luminosities of their supermassive black holes. So this seems to suggest that TDEs and AGN appear to exhibit more efficient accretion, which might be related to the interaction of the stellar debris with the pre-existing accretion. Okay, so moving into the, the final section of this talk, focusing on uh, what we can learn from studying the environments of transients and what they can tell us about the underlying objects. So I've carried out a few studies in this area. Uh, I focus, I've carried out a study looking at the locations of long duration gamma ray bursts within their host galaxies. But I only have time to tell you about my study of the host galaxy of GW170817 and the constraints that we can place on the progenitor system. So GW170817 was the first binary neutron star merger detected by LIGO and of course the first uh, joint detection of gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation. So the, this here is the time frequency map from the gravitational wave data. Uh, so if you take the gravitational wave signal from multiple detectors, you can then place uh, kind of a look, you can localize the transient to the sky. Um, uh, and in this case, we, we were able to get a, a you know, fairly uh, tight um, uh, localization region that could be mapped by wide field telescopes. Um, so one of our so our team here at Harvard uh, was one of the teams that discovered an optical counterpart to this gravitational wave event shown in this before 
and after image here. And when we looked at the, the light curves and spectra of this electromagnetic counterpart, the optical and near-infrared emission, we found that this uh, transient matched remarkably well with the predictions for kilonovi, one of the expected transients uh, 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 predicted to result from neutron star mer mergers. So this was an amazing kind of observational verification of something that was predicted uh, uh, only, uh, you know, five or so years before. Um, and also confirm that neutron star mergers are a, a potentially dominant source of our process elements in the universe, these, these very heavy elements like gold and platinum. So this electromagnetic counterpart also enabled us to precisely localize this event to a particular galaxy, NGC 4993 at 40 megaparsecs. So we were able to study the exact position of this object relative to its galaxy and study the various properties of this host galaxy, its interesting dust and gas uh, shell structures. But I want to focus on uh, what about these host galaxy properties can allow us to, to infer constraints on the progenitor system, and in particular this merger time scale, so how long it took for the two stars um, to merge together. So the way that uh, we kind of carried out this analysis was uh, first collecting kind of all the archival data that we could on this galaxy um, to construct a spectral energy distribution uh, of the galaxy using UV to mid-infrared archival and new data. And then from this, this uh, galaxy uh, modeling, we can infer the star formation history of the galaxy. And we found that this galaxy is an old galaxy that was vigorously forming stars about 10 giga years ago, uh, but has since exhibited a, an exponentially declining star formation history to a very low current star formation rate. So essentially, we can think of this star formation history, uh, you know, if, we, uh, if we can map it to a, a probability distribution uh, for the, the merger time scale of these two, of, of when these two uh, neutron stars were formed, we can then infer how long it took for these events to, to merge together. So this very old stellar population implies, uh, uh, you know, if these events were formed um, 10 billion years ago, it, that implies that it took 10 billion years for these two stars to merge. And this merger time scale is a key parameter for being able to understand um, the, sort of the enrichment history of binary neutron star mergers throughout cosmic time. So it's, it's a critical uh, measurement we want to make for, for large samples of events to understand how neutron star mergers have enriched the universe with time. And then from this merger time scale, we can go further and place constraints on the progenitor binary system uh, parameters. So the kind of initial eccentricity and initial separation of the two neutron stars. So the, this merger time scale, you know, combined with what we know about how gravitational radiation <coughs> affects the decay of the, the orbit of the, the two neutron stars, we can then place a constraint on the eccentricity and initial separation. So for most eccentricities, the initial separation is in the range of about 4 to 10 solar radii or so, well within kind of uh, measurements for other, uh, for known galactic binary neutron stars. And so what we want to do in the future with very large samples of, of these kinds of constraints is to, to try and understand more about massive binary evolution. So, you know, this process of how you go from these, these massive stars in a binary orbit to the final double neutron star binary. So there's a whole host of, of uncertain phases of this evolution uh, that we're going to be able to essentially reverse engineer constraints on based on what we can infer about the this neutron star binary at the final stage of this evolution. So moving into thinking about uh, uh, the future, like what we were just talking about, so LIGO, uh, the LIGO-Virgo observing run three began just a few weeks ago, and actually within, almost within 24 hours, the second binary neutron star merger uh, was detected, so um, it's been kind of a hectic day trying to uh, um, identify an electromagnetic counterpart, 
but luckily I had an excuse to get some sleep last night. Um, so you know, this is this is a major focus right now is trying to identify more electromagnetic counterparts of, of future mergers. And as more detectors come online, uh, we're going to be able to have better localizations and study these events out to further distances, building up large samples of these localized uh, mergers. And that's going to allow us to perform these st statistical studies of their host galaxy and progenitor properties. And then thinking about the future uh, in terms of these wide field optical surveys and, and superluminous supernovae and TDEs, we've recently had the beginning of the Zwicky Transient Facility, which is already starting to, to boost the, the, the discovery rate of these rare transients. Um, and also we have LSST, which is coming online in just a few years. And so the, the number of transients discovered per night is increasing by many orders of magnitude. However, a, a point I want to make is that uh, discovering more transients is not necessarily going to automatically lead to more knowledge. You know, we, uh, in, you know, as it pertains to these very rare, unusual uh, um, transients. So we need these kind of methods that I've talked about uh, in this talk that has been a part of our, our project of, of being able to efficiently extract them from surveys to conduct real-time follow-up uh, to very late times to really get a detailed picture of each event. And it's, you know, it's not trivial how we're going to be able to do this efficiently with LSST. If we look at what a superluminous supernova might look like at a redshift of 1, you know, it's a relatively sparse light curve, uh, the, looking at the data points here. So we need to think about strategies uh, for, for how to do this. And you know, we're already starting to think about machine learning strategies of how we can do this the most effective way. And then thinking about the, the science directions related to these rare transients as we move forward, we really want to continue to place constraints on the power sources of superluminous supernovae. Think about ways where we can um, try and constrain uh, smoking gun signatures of the central engine. And also connecting these explosions to their progenitor stars that lead to these explosions. What, um, what about these stars uh, lead to these, these very rare types of uh, uh, explosions. And for TDEs, there's a lot we still need to understand about the emission mechanisms and also their very wide diversity. You know, as, what I, as I've talked about uh, in this talk, you know, part of my, my focus has been carrying out this very late time follow-up of superluminous supernovae. And so this is something you know, we're really trying to do for more events. Uh, you know, there's some promising progress uh, showing that some events, uh, you know, exhibit these very long-term flattening phases in their in their late-time light curves, which might be consistent with what we expect from, uh, you know, the spin down of of a uh, central engine. And so, you know, I recently submitted an HST proposal um, to 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 do this for that this this event that I've talked about, uh, PS16FGT, along with a, a observation we already have scheduled. So this is something that I you know, want to do with much larger samples rather than just a handful of events. And thinking more in the, on this theme of the environments of, of transients, you know, with these, these new surveys coming online, we're going to be able to do much larger statistical studies of the host galaxies. So just to summarize, at the beginning I talked about um, you know, how we uh, use these motivated selection methods for efficiently identifying superluminous supernovae and TDEs from these wide field transient surveys. And this, this efficient identification has allowed me to do this detailed late time follow up of uh, superluminous supernovae to constrain their power sources and also a tidal disruption event in an AGN. And then the last part I mentioned how one of my environmental uh, uh, studies, studying the host galaxy of GW170817 to place constraints on the progenitor properties. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and taking us on a walk through the landscape of the body kind of Questions? 
Uh, so I noticed, at least in the case of um, the gravitational wave source, uh, a lot of these seem to be fairly far removed from the centers of the galaxies. Is that expected? And um, would uh, resolving the sort of stellar populations at larger radius, like what effect uh, are those kind of radial gradients within the galaxy going to have on um, what you learn about the progenitors? Yeah. So they the uh, you know the. The short, uh, the short gamma ray bursts, which we now know are a result from the mergers of, of neutron stars, do tend to have fairly large offsets. So this is probably, you know, uh, due to the the essentially velocity kicks that you get when you form the neutron stars. Um, so I do think, you know, it's it's a big, it's definitely a, a major question of where these, where in their galaxies do these neutron star uh, neutron star binaries form. And you know where do they end up? Because if you have, if it's evolving for ten billion years, you know it's, it's difficult to to go from its current location of, of where the merger happened to the the birth location. So I think there's there's definitely a lot uh, more kind of uh, modeling of these galaxies that we can do to to kind of link uh, the, their current locations and, and try and place constraints on their birth sites. So I was wondering about the superluminal supernovae. Uh, so you, you have this new model with, uh, where the magnetar is spinning down and providing energy at, at late times. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the plots that you were showing, you were adding that to the cobalt decay. Um, and, and also, uh, I'm wondering how many kind of parameters you can tweak there. I mean, can you fit any generic ski slope with, with this model? Or <laughs> yeah, so so those those magnetar fits that I found were actually only considering energy input from magnetars. So no, there's no energy input from radioactive decay. Um, and you know that is that has been a criticism uh, you know of the magnetar model that there are some parameters. You know, there's like the kind of the spin and magnetic field that you can tweak, um, but it's generally. <coughs> You know, you, you kind of what we, what we found by fitting these light curves is that you know it does you do require kind of very specific combinations of spin and, and magnetic field to produce these light curves. Um, so you need you know you need rapid rotation. Um, you need kind of a there's kind of a Goldilocks region of, of magnetic field where if it's too weak or too strong, then it, it, you can't produce a, a superluminous supernovae. Um, uh, so you know there are these parameters that we can play with, and, and it really comes down to uh, kind of the how the the engine time scale relates to the the, the diffusion time scale, um, the, the the ejecta. So. Okay, well, let's thank Peter. For the committee members, we're going to convene and craft yes. in about 15 minutes.